I'm Vanessa, the associate editor at Book Riot, here with another roundup of new books for new release. First is a book that I talked a little bit about in Friday's video on my favorite lady detectives, and that is A Murderous Relation by Deanna Rayborn. If you have not read the Veronica Speedwell books, this is the fifth in a series that I only recently discovered. So I'm pretty jazzed that I now know that I have, you know, five books to catch up on. The first one, which is what I'll kind of tell you about first, is where we meet Veronica Speedwell. She has just buried her aunt. She was raised by her two aunts. She was an orphan, you know, foundling and just raised by these two women with little, I think, to no knowledge of who her parents were. They raised her very interestingly. She kind of bounced around everywhere, never stayed in one place for more than a couple of years at a time. She wasn't traditionally educated, but she's super smart. She's a lepidopterist, so she studies butterflies and she travels all around the world very independently, regardless of what, you know, polite society thinks of the fact that she chooses not to marry and enjoy the company of men whenever she so feels. When her aunt passes away, shortly passes, passes away, and she's getting ready to take a big trip again to go study butterflies and just do her thing, an intruder shows up at the cottage that once belonged to her aunt. She believes it's just, you know, your average burglar, but the guy actually tries to drag her into a waiting carriage until someone intervenes. The person who intervenes is a German baron who lets her know that she's in grave danger and that he needs to accompany her to her next destination and that he will tell her what's going on in time, but like not right away. While he ties up some loose ends, leaves her with a friend of his who is this really kind of rough around the edges also natural historian and taxidermist. Veronica hangs out there for a few days thinking everything will be just fine, but she's, you know, they're starting to get sick of each other's company. They don't know each other very well. And then the newspaper gets delivered and the headline reads that the Baron that, you know, was supposedly gonna help her out has been found dead in his home. And that kicks off essentially the mystery. You know, Stoker, who's the name of that taxidermist and Veronica have to go on the run and then of course get to the bottom of who it is that is chasing them. These mysteries take place in Victorian England, you know, the late 1880s. That first book kind of kicks off the adventures of Veronica Speedwell and every book from there also, you know, involves some sort of mystery for her to solve. This fifth one, A Murderous Relation, involves a scandal with the royal family, specifically Prince Albert, that the someone has enlisted their help in trying to prevent the kind of outbreak of that scandal. But this is all going on at the same time that Jack the Ripper is starting to terrorize London. If you love lady detectives the way I do, you should definitely watch the video from Friday. <laughs> but yeah, if you're a fan of like the Sherry Thomas Lady Sherlock series, if you like historical mysteries, stuff with a really strong female protagonist and anything set in Victorian England, then this is gonna, you know, check off a lot of those boxes for you. And that again is A Murderous Relation by Deanna Rayborn. Next is A Phoenix First Must Burn, which is edited by Patrice Caldwell. And this collection is so fantastic. I have mo read most of it. So Patrice Caldwell, A, dedicates the book to Tony and Octavia. <laughs> so I'm probably don't have to tell you who Tony and Octavia are, and then talks about in, you know, the introduction how growing up she was a huge fan of Star Wars and the Twilight Zone, but then when she would go to her local library, it was like, hey, none of the people in the books I like to read look or sound or, you know, are like me, and you guys know I love to talk about representation. It focuses on stories about black women and black gender non-conforming individuals told through science fiction, fantasy, magic, folklore, etc. This list of contributors, I'm just naming the ones I can think of top of my head, L.L. McKinney, Elizabeth Acevedo, Justina Ireland, Evie Zaboy, Patrice Caldwell herself, it is just so fantastic. And they definitely, you know, get to a thing that I wonder all the time, and I know a lot of you wonder all the time, which is, you know, why can people of color exist in speculative fiction? It, <laughs> like, you quickly believe that a dragon or, you know, other mythical creature could exist, but then you throw a black or brown person into the mix and people are like, Burr? This book has witches and scientists and priestesses and sisters, lovers, it's stories of resistance and resilience and hope. There's just so much to love. It's just full of so much unapologetic blackness as it should be. It's it's wonderful. I love every single one of these stories that I've read so far. Uh, Danielle Clayton is in this too. I forgot to mention that's the story that I'm working on at the moment. But uh, for those of you who don't know, the title itself, A Phoenix First Must Burn, is taken from Octavia Butler's Parable of the Talent. So again, this is in so many ways an homage to um, the women that came before these individuals and just it's full of 
literal black girl magic and again gender non gender non-conforming magic but anyway i'm rambling check out a phoenix first must burn by patrice caldwell edited by patrice caldwell words are hard today next i have animals of lockwood manor by jane healy this is a work of historical fiction set in august 1939 hetty cartwright has secured a job working at a natural history museum in london specifically looking over the exhibit of stuffed animals and by stuffed animals i we don't mean like the kind you get at Build-A-Bear, <laughs> but actually, you know, taxidermy animals, the kind you see in museums. Then on the brink of World War II, the museum decides to relocate its entire collection in order to protect it from the expected bombings that are, you know, sure to hit the city any second now. So Hetty is assigned to continue to look over these stuffed animals, but now at a sort of decaying old mansion out in the English countryside. The mansion is looked over or the manor by a very tyrannical kind of overbearing character named Lord Lockwood. He is a difficult person to work for and on top of that Hetty finds that she was just wholly unprepared for how difficult it was going to be to look over her charges protecting them from like rowdy party guests and wild animals and just all sorts of interesting factors I want to let you discover. And she finds that she's scorned by the staff of this manor as well. And the one person that she sort of strikes up a friendship with, although an interesting one, is with Lucy Lockwood, who is Lord Lockwood's sort of very haunted, unstable daughter who sort of roams around the manor at all hours of the night and day for reasons. When the animals begin to disappear and then reappear in some interesting places, disconcerting places, <laughs> Hetty and Lucy begin to wonder what it is exactly that they're protecting the animals from, and Hetty is left to wonder what it is that is watching her and stalking her through the dark corridors of Lockwood Manor. This book is going to be perfect for fans of Sarah Perry, author of The Essex Serpent and Melmoth, and also for Kate Morton fans. I do love me some Kate Morton, very atmospheric books that are mostly set in like English country and or seaside locations, some I think in Australia. I am now in regular rotation on the All the Books, po All the Books podcast that airs every Tuesday as well with Liberty. And on this last episode that I was just on or will be on today, <laughs> Tuesday, go get them to your podcatchers. Liberty talks about how, yeah, in World War II, there were several different forms of, you know, resistance and you could take people into your home, which is, you know, one option and obviously a very noble option. Or you could also volunteer to look after big collections of art. And that, yeah, that's what was done. Most of the art and antiquities that exist today from that era are only around because museums took that step to relocate all of those collections to various, various locations and they often tried to move them away from the city, hoping that they would be, you know, less of a of a target that way. So yeah, really interesting tidbit from history that I, I feel like I heard a little bit about, but had mostly forgotten the details of. So uh, this book scratches, yeah, all those historical fiction, gothic fiction, moody, atmospheric fiction, itches, lots of itches to be scratched, apparently. <laughs> Again, that is The Animals of Lockwood Manor by Jane Healy. Next is Good Citizens Need Not Fear by Maria Reva. So this collection of stories, of like linked stories, is all set or all takes place in sort of a rundown Ukrainian building in the very chaotic... I believe aftermath, I always get this part right wrong, if it's aftermath or lead up, I think it's aftermath of the fall of the Soviet Union. The story opens with a kind of Kafka-esque situation where a gentleman is talking to administrative officials about the fact that the heat has gone out in his entire building and the woman who helps him is like, Boop, 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 boop. Oh, your address doesn't exist. It's like, yeah, it does. I live there. She's like, no, it doesn't. It's like, yes, it does. I live there with a lot of other people. I'm not, it's a building. She's like, no, it's not. <laughs> so he, again, drafts sort of this Kafka esque uh, way of proving to her that the address does indeed exist. The second story features a orphan. She's this four year old girl named Zaya in an orphanage, an orphan in an orphanage who lifts up the floorboards in, I think it's her room at the orphanage, and finds the remains, the mummified remains of another orphan under the floorboards. And <laughs> I know this is, sounds kind of morbid, but it is darkly funny because she believes that this is a sign. It's like a, a saint that's been sent to guide her on her uh, adventure or her really her uh, journey to escape. And she does escape the orphanage, although she does later have to come back. 
these characters and a couple others are the threads we watch Zaya in particular grow up and they are woven throughout sometimes as main characters or side characters throughout the rest of these stories. I don't want to obviously spoil all the stories for you because you should read them for yourself but in case you kind of haven't picked up on this the book really focuses on the strange situations and often day-to-day -day stuff that one goes through even in the middle of giant because of in some cases giant political dysfunction and, you know, upheaval that results from it. Parts are very darkly funny, other parts are really surprisingly tender, and it reminded me a lot if you read Christadora by Tim Murphy, again another story about, or book of, of stories about lots of different people living in a building and how their stories are all connected in sometimes subtle and other more obvious ways. It was just a book that I did not expect to love as much as I did. I picked it up kind of on a whim and it was great and maybe it's because you know, we are ourselves, though not of the same maybe scale, but we are in the middle of some interesting political times and it is sort of a step back and also zooming in into the ways in which life kind of has to go on in the middle of all that and some of the day-to-day -day stuff that you deal with is not necessarily related to that bigger picture, but the overall angst of it does absolutely weave its way into those details of your everyday life. So again, today is a really good day for me to ramble, but pick up Good Citizens Need Not Fear by Maria Reba. And last is Harley in the Sky by Akemi Don Bowman. In this book, Harley Milano has always dreamed of being a trapeze artist. Her parents own and operate this giant, most like famous circus in Las Vegas, and she watches every night from the big top and sort of, you know, fawns over their lead aerialist, hoping and praying that like one day she too could be an aerialist. Her parents are not down with this plan whatsoever. They want her to pursue a traditional education. And so one night they have a giant fight that results in Harley running away from home and joining the rival traveling circus. She's suddenly thrust into a world that is both, you know, brutal and beautiful and gets a hard lesson in what you know, true hard work and bravery and passion means. None of that sounds particularly bad per se, but she does soon have to come to terms with the cost of pursuing her dream, specifically all the people that she's hurt and left behind with this decision. I love that Harley is a multiracial teen because again, I just love to see uh, non-issue books issue books are important, but it's so nice to see non-issue books about brown people. <laughs> I'm always going to love those. This is described as, I think This Is Us meets The Greatest Showman, like by way of Sarah Dessen. So I'm like, is this going to make me cry? Because everyone I know that watches This Is Us is like, get the tissues. <laughs> Look that one up. It sounds absolutely lovely and a really gorgeous cover too. <laughs> and that's Harley in the Sky by Akemi Dawn Bowman. That's all I've got for you today. Tune in next week for another batch of new books. Happy reading.